Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We have two special guests today, Alana and Dean Stott. Um, tell me who you guys are and how we ended up on the show today. Because it's going to be, usually it's just one person, so it's easy to just give me your background. But now we've got two people, and I need to hear your individual backgrounds and then how it intersected. Yeah. I'll probably let you start it. No, we start. Yeah. So, um, so I was at UK Special Forces um, for your list as a special boat service. Not not many people have heard of us, but mm. it's the equivalent of Dev Group uh, for the UK. So we do a lot with Dev Group, and I uh, did 16 years in the military. And unfortunately, I had a tragic uh, parachute accident, which ended my career, shortened my career. I had really no aspirations of being a civilian at all, and uh, found myself actually a couple of years before that. Alana and I just met, and um, with my injury found myself uh, working in the private security sector. But um, from the early off, Alana and I have always worked together. Um, people normally see me, but actually behind the scenes, as which we'll talk about shortly, Alana pretty much runs runs everything. Um, you know, she told me what time to be here today, uh, you know, and what to wear. And, um, but yeah, I, I went on in the security industry, did some very um, high profile jobs, um, single-handedly evacuated the Canadian embassy out of Libya on my own in 2014. Evening, your American ambassador got killed in Benghazi. Mm -hmm. I was there pulling an oil company through safe houses uh, back to Tripoli. So that's that was what I was doing day in, day out. Um, Alana and I then, ca I came back from one of those trips and Alana had told me that um, I'd only been home 21 days in a whole 365 day period. So something had to change. So in my book, there's chapter 16 is called Dead or Divorce. That was a conversation Alana and I were having at the time. Um, and so I hung up my, um, my my security boots and started working with Alana, who's very, as you'll get to know her shortly, very entrepreneurial, big philanthropist. And for me, it was all about when I left the military, I'd lost my identity. I'd got to where I had in the military because my physical robustness um, I now couldn't even run a hundred meters. So I just bought a push bike off Amazon. Um, and then yeah, six months later applied for the world record for the world's longest road, having only cycled 20 miles. Um, a year later set off. It's the world's longest road. It runs from Southern Argentina to Northern Alaska, uh, 14,000 miles. Um, I cycled it. Alana ran the whole campaign, mm -hmm. raised the money, got me sponsorship everything else and yeah broke the wheel record by 17 days became the first man in history to do it under 100 days which you know probably upset the cycling community but it was really just to keep myself physically and mentally engaged so that was me um but as i've touched on none of that would have been possible uh without alana uh so i'll bring alana yeah I uh, I grew up in in Aberdeen in Scotland so I was uh a, like a thousand different jobs but finance was my main background so I'd been a debt collector and then I met Dean I was a bank manager um he was injured quite quickly after us being together so my transition kind of went to what I done to then helping him um and that was that was like a different world for me because he'd gone from being at the top to the bottom and we had to kind of pull him pull him back up but funny enough how I met you I think I met you at the 511 event mm -hmm. at the shot show and that's really the typical fashion of of Dean and I because it was De Dean's sponsor to 511 but he's never around to do any of these things because he's always here there and everywhere at the last minute so I was there with the baby um kind of representing Dean um and that really probably like is a really good example of what our life is it's just super fast paced um, we've been working in the security industry since 2011. So Dean's either away on a task or if he is at home or planning the next task, it could be he could get home at two o'clock in the afternoon and be away by 10 o'clock that night. So it's always been that kind of crazy lifestyle. But we've got three kids and they kind of just fit into what we do. Um, so it really is kind of a, a high paced, no excuses, <laughs> crazy life. So it's quite unique that you've actually got us both. This is very rare. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, lucky me, right? <clears throat> um, yeah. So how how is it that uh, what do you, what do you think it was that that drew you two towards each other? Because I get this sense in the modern world, there's less and less people who are kind of defining their lives by purpose. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
and you see people that it seems like a, a lot of folks are just kind of winging it through life. Uh, you know, that, I understand the, the, I, I don't know, I guess the sentiment that some people share that they feel, um, almost fatalistic about their lives because, well, I'm supposed to do this by this age and then this by this age. And people, the, the rebellion to that was just to do nothing. It seems right. I mean, but which is yeah. fucking stupid. So yeah. I, I wonder if for, for you two guys, was it that it seems like you both have are very driven, very purpose driven, but also, uh, uh, can get out of your own way and let other people help you. And that, I think that's an important part of having a relationship with another person that's a type A personality. Yeah. Yeah, I I um, grew up, you know, it was always the buck stops with me in my life. Like mm. there was never an excuse or somebody else's fault. If it went wrong, it was me that needed to fix it. So my mom died when I was 15 and she was a single mom. Um, and then I had some brothers to look after as well. So responsibility and things was always with me. But so I never had, um kind of drive to be the little wife or anything like that it was always going to be my my forward moving but so pretty much being single till I met Dean and then when I met Dean and I saw this other character who had drive who had purpose and I remember the first thing that really drew me to him was he said you know do you do you enjoy being a bank manager and I said well I can do it and it's easy but it's probably not the full thing that I want to do and he says well you know if you could do anything what is it you want to do and I said I've always wanted to be a spy that's what I've always wanted to do and the very next day he had the application form for MI6 and had set up a call with me with one of his guys who was in Whitehall to talk me through the process of of how to do it so that was the moment I realized yeah this is the guy that that he's got the same kind of focus and mentality as me yeah, and we're coming up to 14 year anniversary from when we met. And um, unlike Lana, who was single until I met her, I hadn't. I had a couple of failed relationships. So I was like, ah, I am done mm. uh, with, with, with relationships. And, you know, being single in the special forces, my my sort of passion was just to go on deployments. And, and, and that was it. So I actually wasn't looking for any partners at all. And that's typical of the case. You know, I've never been on any dating apps. You know, I probably wouldn't know how to log in. I'm such a technophobe anyway. But, and so, yeah, so I just, uh, we just bumped into each other. I mean, we just, we just hit it off straight away. And, um, and what I liked about the difference I would say with Lana is in my previous relationships, there was a lot of, we don't like you doing this. We want you to leave the military. Whereas Alana was like, ah, no, I, I like that mm -hmm. you're in the military. And, and was pushing me so i was pushing her but she was also pushing me and then if i ever doubted myself and there was a few occasions especially after my injury and you know lana was the one who picked me up and she's like no you can you can do this from a personal perspective you know i didn't plan on leaving the military i didn't have that transition uh runway mm. it was literally a short period and i was out you know the military are very good they're like your your mother, your father, they clothe you, they feed you, they pay you on time, you know, they sort the electricity, the gas. So you can focus on your job mm. solely. You don't have to worry about that background noise. So I joined the military at 17 and sort of left those responsibilities to, to the military. So my worries of becoming a civilian were like Alana's day to day. It was nothing. Alana yeah. set up a security company on her mobile phone in about 10 minutes. You know, for me, I'm like, oh, my God, I wouldn't even know where to do the paperwork. So we we identified quite quickly our strengths and weaknesses. Um, Alana very much so in, in, in the business, how it has some money and stuff, and me just more operational on the ground. And so that that really formed quite a, a bond quite early as well. Mm. Um, and Alana wanted something new. So when I was getting out, Alana trained to be, she, she's trained in close protection, surveillance, maritime security, no, we were going to do it together, and a bit like in modern day Mr. and Mrs. Smith. You know, that's what we were sort of looking at. Um, but uh, then Alana then fell pregnant with our first daughter, so that sort mm. of changed. Of course, <laughs> it was his daughter, that. right? Everybody in special operations has daughters for some reason. No, I don't know. Yeah, is that a, is that a thing with the SAS and SBS as well? Because all of our operators over here just have daughters always. We, we, we have a theory. We have a theory because I was also in the I was in the engineers before, so I was mm. the senior diving instructor. All the divers had daughters as well, and they reckon it's to do with pressure. They reckon pilots divers it's to do with with pressure i don't know whether that's good because one of my friends actually you know, he had three boys and all of that so he's, he's just thrown that theory out the window but yeah I, I i do hear it's a common theme i don't know whether it's just a really you know, young girls will wrap their fingers around their dad or it's yeah, punishment 
that, well, yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the anecdotal theory is that it's punishment for all the uh, the bullshit, you know. But um, there is some truth to it. That I've, I've de- there's definitely a high rate of female birth um, amongst uh, special forces operators, at least here in the U.S. Um, you yeah. mentioned something about not having a runway. And I don't know how well the UK does with this, but the U- the US military doesn't do a great job of preparing people for life after the military. You know what I mean? Um, yep. uh, and it's like just having it, but you know, it's, it's reflective of, of our public education system as well. We teach stuff that we think people need to know about how many kids coming out of school know how to change a tire or balance a bank account or, or do their taxes or any of this shit. Right. I mean, they're, they're woefully unprepared for life. And then you, in in our situation, I got out when I was 30, so it wasn't that bad, I guess. But when you're like in your late 30s, early 40s, and you, you, your entire adult life has been managed by somebody else, and now all of a sudden it's like, all right, you got to do all this stuff for yourself. Um, yeah. it, it's a bit much, and we don't, we don't do very much to really help people during that transition period. Even when you do have the runway, it doesn't really work out that well, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I started working when I was 11 um, and, you know, first of all, it was just for the extra treats and then my mum was sick, it was to pay the bills. So it's always been a way of, um, I've always had to look after someone else. So when I, when Dean was getting out, I went to the little transition workshop that they had just to see what kind of thing was being offered to the guys. And I, I was like disgusted. I was like, what the hell is this? Like, okay, we'll teach you how to write a CV. Well, there's not much going on that CV apart from that one little query we've had for the whole over the last 20 years but what about the fact that you're about to go from a full-time employed job to self-employed your mortgage status is going to change like do you have a house yet things like credit cards have you got any of them sorted out yet how are you going to budget plan all these things nothing was taught and I, I spoke to the guy at the end I was like is this it is this as much as you're going to teach them before you send them off into the big bad world mm-hmm. and then also when you go out there will you mind just not killing anybody else or getting into any fights or getting drunk or anything else because if you do we're going to arrest you and put yeah, you in jail no shit. Yeah, yeah. But they, like when we go on an op, we'll build a fucking mock of the building and run through it 200 times before we go raid that building. But no, yeah. no real preparation for actual life. You know what I mean? And I like I understand why during the time in service, they try to take some of that stuff out of your hand because distracted equals dead. But yeah. man, you know, I, I'm not sure that that I'm not sure that ignorance is bliss in that s- situation. You know what I mean? Even, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, I think for me and my, my personal one is, you know, I got out in 2011, as Alana touched on, it was, here's how to write a CV and interview techniques. Well, I've never written a CV and I've never had an interview since leaving. And then a, a couple of years back, uh, a mate of mine left and um, he said, look, I'm looking for work. So I managed to get him some work uh, in Europe, uh, connected him with the with the CEO. Um, and he's like, oh, I'm just about to do a, I'm just about to give him the invoice. And I looked at the invoice and I was like, okay, you can't invoice him for the task. It's not actually happened yet. Mm-hmm. You need a mobilization fee. What's your scope of work? You know, and things like that. He said, what does that, what does all that mean? I said, right. I said, what they, what they now teaching back in the special forces? He said, CV and interview techniques. It hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. But what they do is the, the guy who's actually running them as well for the special forces is a guy who's never been in civilian street himself. It's a, it's a, we call a late entry officer. It's another job that can be filled by someone still in. They don't have anyone from that sector. So, um, you know, I sat down with him and I explained that. Um, I think they're slowly getting there. I do um, I do a lot of work here or 5%, $5 of my book goes towards the Honor Foundation, which is, I, I've, I've been along to one of their transition programs to see that 13 mm-hmm. weeks. And that is so far advanced from where we are in the UK. My old unit, the association, I bumped into, I met them last year. They're coming over actually to see how, you guys do it. So if you think you're not doing it well, <laughs> we're we're still behind you over there as well. Yeah, and we're but we're all ahead of Canada because they'll just give you a free punch card to go get a suicide if you feel like yeah, yeah. you're having a bad day. Here's suicide for you. It's crazy up there. Exactly. I didn't know if they had a military Canada. I wasn't too sure. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> they have I'm good snipers. Get... Yeah, that's it. To understand who they are as well. Part of my book on how to ask for money, I talk about. Mm. The guys that I work with, they'll come out and they've got no idea how to charge for mm. the service, what value they are to the work they're doing. They'll or how to write a business plan or anything, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm going to do a close protection task. Um, I'm getting paid 250 bucks a day for it. It's awesome. What? You know, like, yeah. you know, 
Like we need to look at that. Um, and I think really trying when I'm speaking to them about, I've seen guys and I've said like, right, what's going on? Oh, my finances are bad. Let me look through. Well, these five invoices haven't been paid. Oh yeah, I don't want to send them because the task's over with now and I feel a bit awkward asking for the payment now. And it's like, dude, this is your money. This is your life. You've got to pay the bills now. Well, we come from a, best way to explain it when, when, I, when Alana mentions that, now we come from a culture where, you know, if I was in Afghanistan planning a mission, I need two CH-47s, I need a UAV, I need some fast air, I need 40 guys from the squadron, we need this, 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 this. No one gives me a bill. No one tells me the cost of all that, a scope of work. Mm. It's done. It's automatically done for you. So you enter a world like that and you don't see the value of life. Um, you know, when I evacuated the Canadian embassy, I charged $7,000 mm. for eight military and four diplomats. Could I... For me, it was about the right thing. It was getting them out and making sure they were safe and, and home. Whereas actually it's the world of business. <laughs> the land is like, well, there is a cost on that life and it, it is, is what this is. But we do, we we come from an environment where our mission set is to protect and, and help people. And we don't see a value on life when in fact we should be uh, knowing our worth, which Alana talks about more. I mean, actually putting a cost on that because mm -hmm. we are worth a hell of a lot of money to these uh, these corporates. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Alana, the the book, How to Ask for Money, you know, you took you took your expertise in a field and then you ran into uh, to this guy who you're like, I, I just imagine you're like, OK, you're fucked up like a football bat over here. Like this is this guy has no idea what he's doing. And then just to correctly probably assumed that that's a bigger, pervasive, more pervasive problem throughout uh, the veteran community. Right. And which it is. And then you use your institutional knowledge to help people in finance, especially with um, when it, like what we're talking about when it comes to entrepreneurship, because one of the biggest barriers to entry is just the anxiety associated with not knowing what the fuck to do. People just don't know what to do. They don't know how to, to write a business plan. They don't know how to develop a capitalization table. They don't know how to do any of this stuff. They don't know how to go ask for money right from people. And then be able to demonstrate the value of their product for that money so everybody feels good in the situation and they make the right partnerships right i think it's a big like we're in this creator economy globally but particularly in the west now and there's a lot of people taking big swings and i see a lot of big misses and it's it a lot of them are unnecessary misses because if they had just had the information that you have right they would have been able to do all this I stuff think they, um... The amount of times I see an amazing business with amazing people, like a team that could really just blow up and they fail because they've not got that side of it mm. right. The business side of it isn't right. They've got the right team. They've got everything that's going, but they've not got that side done. And I think for me, going back to like when I was a debt collector, I got the job as a debt collector. Really, at the time I was doing door-to-door -door sales. So I was walking around Scotland in the middle of winter at night time. It was freezing cold. And I was like, I want a different job. So I got offered this job. And it was, you know, it was a really male dominated environment and their approach was knock on the door and shout and scream at the person asking for money. Um, and I was like, well, that's not going to work for me. I need to do something a bit different. So I would sit down with the person and be like, right, where did this go wrong? Where's your budget gone wrong? How did it happen? Let's do a plan. Let's let's sort it out together. And then eventually I became the number one debt collector in Scotland just because I was helping them rather than forcing them and they would pay me first. Um, and I took that through really everything that I'd done that, you know, my purpose was to help people in that way. And then when I seen what was happening in the veteran community in the UK, I was like, well, look, I could help here as well. Even with nonprofits that we were working with, their approach to raising funds was either one or two ways. There's two ways that people raise money. It's either through the heartstrings, which is like, this is my cause. Can you please donate to it? It's a really important cause and, and I want you to love it too. Or approach the corporates. There wasn't there isn't many that do it both mm. or that understand that it's a business as a whole. So I wanted to put that into some sort of manageable uh, formula that people could then work with and be like, right. So with how to ask for money, you could take it as a business or you could take it as a nonprofit and you could walk through each step to put it together and get like this like something decent to be able to present because the fear of walking in and asking for money is just fear of the unknown like mm. everything else and the more that you can make it unknown the better so yeah reject yeah. Yeah. well that's in in uh in american politics and fundraising it's called the hard ask that's what they call that right like that's the you, a lot of people anybody can man a phone anybody can uh create digital you know stuff and, and send it out to try to fundraise and stuff but 
retail politics one-on-one is usually the most effective way of doing it. And a lot of people just, a lot of people for one reason or another have a hard time with the hard ask. They have a hard time just looking at somebody like, Hey, it seems like you agree with what we're doing here. How much money can you get me? Right. Because it's maybe they feel like it's rude or it's too direct or whatever. We, we're just not good at interpersonal communication in a lot of ways these days. Uh, we would rather send a text message and fuck off, you know? Over the years, especially with social media, we have like our egos have kind of grown and our mm. entitled belief that we deserve things has grown. So actually, like when it comes to that nervous moment, and especially as the new generations are coming, like you can barely get kids to pick up the phone or speak to someone directly in the eyes now. It's like these things are stopping us having that ability to have that strength to stand one to one, look somebody in the eye and ask them the question. So that, I think, doesn't help either. Uh, certainly not. No. You know, we it, it is uh, we talk about it with the younger generation a lot, but I think our generation as well has a lot of problems with this stuff. I think the from from having latchkey parents, you know, to to getting into a corporate world that despite the labor movements in both of our countries, it seems like, you know, corporations have have doubled down on just extracting wealth out of their employees instead of trying to provide a career. You know what I mean? That that like you should be able to work a full time job and own a home. That that should be a thing. And if you can't, then we got fucking problems, right? And not not just it's not an ethical or moral problem necessarily or only. It is a problem for the economy when you can't own a home like that because the vast majority of the wealth that any middle class person's gonna build in their lifetime is in the equity in their home, right? That's how that works. So we've we've now made people uh generationally poor that were middle class before. It's it's we're going in the wrong direction here. Yeah, I actually got asked to do a, a talk for someone recently on how to ask for money. <laughs> and uh, the guy came on the phone, he says, what is it you talk about? It was to a, a, a large media company. And he says, what is it that you talk about? And I explained, it's about teaching people their value, understanding their worth, all those things. And he said, okay, I need you not to talk about that. I don't want you telling our employees to understand <laughs> their, their value and their worth. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, I can't do this without, um, this is what we do and really you you, you know well respected valued employees are going to give you a help he says yeah but this is a bad economy we can't be paying them any more money I can't have them asking for more money and I was just like dude I can't do this like I can't you're not understanding and I really don't want to work with you either because you don't and neither should any of your employees but yeah that's um, not uh, that's not great <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Jesus um, so you've written uh, another book um she who dares and I, I assume that's kind of taken from who dares wins which is the sas model you you guys have a different one right sbs has a different model right yeah by strength and guile mm. yeah i like yeah, that so. um but tell, tell me about that book what what's th this is kind of like your autobiography or what is this yeah she who dares came from so dean wrote relentless mm -hmm. and in that I guess quite a bit and then a few people were saying well when's Alana's book coming out and I've always written I've written all my life but it was more just as a journal this one was just a, a life journal I guess and then I didn't have any intentions of ever it being out there but I spoke to a few people about what is in the book and they were like well you know this is my experience in life and I said well in the book I talk about how you can get through that and then I thought well actually I could put this book out and help a lot of people and I'm pretty much an open book so there's nothing that's really secret with me so I was like well let's just just get it out there and see see what it's like so it was just it's just literally just about my life to know and uh yeah. tell me tell me about relentless what what it, this is about your journey I suppose I mean it's like the take it back to the beginning joining the military and then whenever you decided to elevate yourself inside the military it, you know it, it's I like yeah. I like the term relentless because the goal of selection is to not quit, right? I mean, that's like it, yeah, you can't and you can't. Our, I want to talk. I want you to talk about the mental state that you have to be in, where you just can't give yourself. It's like Cortez burning the ships. Like you, you don't give yourself an exit strategy. I'm here to win, and if I don't win, then I'll fucking die. I guess you know. Yeah, well, well that's it, and that I'll, I'll touch on that as well. So yeah, the unrelenting pursuit of excellence is one of the ethos of the UK Special mm -hmm. Forces. You know. You never are excellent. You're always pursuing that excellence. Um, so for me, actually, I never had any ambitions or any aspirations of writing a book at all. The reason I did the bike ride is because I wasn't smuggling people across borders. Um, but because of the success of the bike ride, you know, the world record was 117 days. We did it in 99 days. 
um, and I became the first man in history to do it under 100 days at the age of 41. Um, so I was trying to prove to people it was never too late to get into a sport. But then more impressively, Alana raised $1.3 million for charity as well along the way. So so when we got approached to write a book, I was like, okay, about the bike rider, no, we want to know about you. So the book's basically in three phases. The first phase is my childhood uh, and the military. Mm. You know, my father told me I'd last two minutes in the military. <laughs> he was a military man himself. So, okay, that, that's the fire in my belly to prove him wrong. Sure, and there's yeah. a lot anecdotes like that in the story i'm sure well. he and did I, that on purpose oh yeah without a doubt without <laughs> a doubt yeah, he, he did that on purpose and and a bit like lana i came from a broken family mm. i ended up in a homeless home in moss side in manchester which was the roughest area in in the uk so talk about <clears throat> you know you can be at the bottom but you can get out of that pit i go in i, I talk about the military I and mean, then i stop at the special forces just purely out of for security reasons and respect for my for my fellow brethren that, you know, I don't talk about mm. that, which upsets a few people sometimes, because I think it's a book about special forces. <laughs> but then I talk about, you know, that transition we talked about, uh, the identity crisis, um, working in the security industry. And actually, I did more high profile jobs as a civilian than I did when I was in the special forces, because I had a bit more freedom. I wasn't mm. governed, had the same rules of engagement as others. I had more freedom uh, of movement to be where, where I wanted to be in the world. And so actually, the middle section, you know, some very exciting um, uh, private security stories. And then how we then change, the, take everything we've learned from the first two phases into the bike ride. So, you know, you get, you go in the military, you get to the top of your game within tier one special forces, you then have an injury. You then find yourself working in a, in a, a new, new environment. I and mean, then in security, you can get yourself to the top. But can you do that a third time in a sport that you've never done before? Mm. So actually, and that's what we did. I can't, I'm not the type of person just go join a cycling club. It's like Alana found the world's longest road. I was that perfect. Mm. You know, it might sound quite arrogant to, to especially some cyclists who are like, well, this guy's like 200 pounds. He's only ever cycled uh, 20 miles. But when uh, you touched on it then, and, and we call it no, no plan B, mm -hmm. is when we were training for the bike ride, Alana was fundraising. She raised 70,000 pounds at an event in Scotland. And 50,000 pounds of that money had to go to a deposit for the Hilton Hotel in London for the Welcome Back event. So before we'd even set off, we had a committee planning the Welcome Back event. So there was no pressure. And uh, one of our good friends, she ran, she's a big events organizer. And she said, what's what's the contingency? And I never used to answer her. Uh, Alana would say, well, the contingency is we go to Dean's funeral. Um, <laughs> it was only when I came back, that I, I, sat, I sat with her and I said, look, I said, Amanda, if I knew there was a contingency, when it got hard on that bike ride, you know, when it got difficult, you would automatically start veering off towards that contingency. Mm. So for me, there was no out road. The only road was straight. You know, you you block off those uh, those um, those exit routes. And that can be people as well. I think mm. the one thing that we we do now is we help people that are doing challenges or doing fundraisers things and we can normally tell within about five minutes on the yep. call whether they're going to do it or not and that'll come from the way they're speaking and the way their their people around them are speaking you know if there's excuses being made well if he doesn't do it then this like i'm almost like you're not going to do it yeah. and we can tell straight away if somebody's got that kind of eye of the tiger focus to drive ahead and do it or if they're going to be looking for the easy way out sure yeah i mean do you is that part of uh the the talks you give to this guy because i think it's some people don't know it yet you know what i mean it's the way we the way we talk about things can shape the way we think about things right and it works yeah. in but it works in both directions the way we uh you know visualize things can also shape the way we speak and act but i think it goes in the inverse in a way that's a little bit harder to track so i don't know that everybody is keenly aware of what's happening inside their own head sometimes where when, when yeah. we talk when we give ourselves excuses or you know, we talk negatively about ourselves and aren't able to take compliments and things like that, which I have a problem with myself. You know, it, it's it shapes the way you think about it. You know, it's a it's kind of a fatalistic defeatist attitude sometimes. And that stuff will it's like, uh, you know, it'll creep in in times of great stress that, you know, asshole in your brain. It's like you can't do it as they're talking and you're just feeding that dude ammo to use on you. You know what I mean? And I, I think uh, on, one on that is also surrounding yourself with the right people. Mm -hmm. And I talk about surrounding yourself with the right team, you know, that do one on high performance teams. You know, 
the, the, who are the, the, the first five people around you? How, what is their attitude? If they're quite negative mm-hmm. and, and negative approach, then that's going to have an impact on you. And so we, I know, it doesn't matter whether it's family or friends, we'll just cut them out. Yeah. It's like, you know, we want to surround ourselves with, with the team who has the right attitude. Mm-hmm. Um, I, always, well. I always look at the, the, the most common one that goes on in the world. And, and I've not, like in America, um, they've got the highest percentage of, of cesarean births mm. uh, because this option is given like you can, you know, just have the cesarean, you can do this, you don't need to like fully go, you know, a natural birth. And I think that natural birth as a woman, that gives you that extra power to know exactly what you're capable of. If you think about that moment where, you know, the baby's head's coming out and you can't quit at that point. There's mm. no way you can quit. Even though you think you can't go on and there's nothing more you can do, that shoulders need to come out next. You know, the rest of the baby needs to come. And I think we're like in, in this country, especially they're given this option of, of the easy way to, to do it so much that you're not allowing yourself to be tested mm. to see exactly. It's just, it's more of a metaphor that I'm explaining it that way. But um, if we're not getting that chances, then we're not going to be building ourselves and building our, our resilience and our own inner strength because we're going to hit that um you know the four percent we're, we're naturally using and we're not touching on that but we, yeah if we're filling if we're filling our subconscious with self-doubt and and not believing ourselves then that's the bit we'll listen to when it gets tough mm. yeah and, and the hidden story behind that there's a there's more money in cesarean yeah <laughs> it's in, yeah it's, that's always what it is yeah <laughs> and it's you know i look i'm not gonna shame a woman for not going through natural childbirth because that's probably more painful than anything that i would do but uh it is accurate to say anytime we think we're smart and we're out we're like trying to outsmart nature and shit it never works it, there's always a price to pay definitely yeah. not about like shit it's absolutely not about shame and what what got me was when i went to have my baby here i've had two babies before and they were trying to push me for it. And I yeah, they'll like, schedule what? you and just like come in and get a C-section on yeah. this date. Like, all right, cool, man. And then yeah. they start giving you like fear tactics. I remember mm. one conversation with the doctor, they said stillbirth to me five times. Now, for anybody who hadn't been through it, I can completely understand why you'd be like, yeah, of course, let's go for the C-section. It was, it really was trying to scare me into doing something that I knew that, that I was capable of doing. Yeah, um, but Dean's right. Like, it's about money. Like the procedure costs yeah. more. That's the only reason. Yeah. Well, in, yeah. in the UK, we have the NHS. So mm. it's, you know, it's one of the one of the great things about UK is that, you know, the government, you know, free health care. And the last thing that the last option they give you is a C-section and, <laughs> and any sort of pain relief at all, because it's coming out of the government's budget. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's obviously pharma driven. You know, it was a really interesting period because, you know, it was good cop, bad cop. It was Alana's like, tell them F off. And then I was like, and I was like, almost the media, like that. we come from Europe, we do things slightly different. But yeah, it was very worrying to see how quick they just want to push the farm. And even here, when we came here with our kids, you know, we're like, well, I'm not giving them drugs, 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 yeah. drugs, drugs. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you know, let's talk about hope. that a bit. You guys got three kids now. What are their ages? Uh, 12, seven and 11 months. Um, ooh, brand new. Oh, that's right. I saw your baby in Vegas. Um, yeah. that, yeah. Uh, so what do you, what's it like now raising ki- young kids? I mean, it's, it seems like, it seems like all the stupid shit that goes on in social America, all the, you know, social politics bullshit. See, well, I don't know why, but over the last five years or so, they've just like laser focused, directed on trying to pump the shit into kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's been really interesting. The first thing we had when we came over is because things like your vaccine schedule, totally different mm. to the UK. And it seemed to be when I was questioning things, it was almost how dare you question it but I was given simple questions like well this as far as I know this one is more for bloodborne diseases or sexually transmitted diseases so why do you want to give it to my newborn baby you know just asking simple questions and you were hit with like well just take it and it was like no no no, we're not doing that but we've raised our kids to be very like self-thinkers and they and they question things and um like def- they're they're not anarchists like we're completely against that they're not out there being like feminists or burning their bras doing any of these kinds of things it's about just looking at things I mean I've always been like you know be the example just go out and prove it and do it but for example yesterday Molly started school and she came home and she was like mom we've been given this thing um and it was what pronoun do you identify as 
And I said, okay. And she showed me the sheet and there was about a million different ones for them to, and I said, what do you think about it? And she was like, so we chatted about it and we spoke about what actually is a pronoun in the actual English, you know, the dictionary and we can talk about what it means. And I said, what do you think about why he's asking you? You know, we have a full conversation about it. It's not just like, you will not say that because we're not going to join that group or you, mm. you will do it join in that group. It's let's talk about it and see what we're thinking about what's being asked here. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, you know, that's sunlight's always the best disinfectant. If you just explain things rationally to people, yeah. for, to most people, they can recognize what's fucking stupid and what's not, you yeah. know, um, yeah. and it, especially when there's social pressure around it. I think if you raise somebody who's skeptical but also like just generally speaking mentally resilient they don't fall yeah. for that stuff you know what i mean that the pressure doesn't change the way they think i think it's really more important than any given thing that you teach a young person is to teach them how to think right and how to how to be skeptical of nonsense yeah and i, I think what you mentioned there is the stupidity you know some people just don't know and so it's always good to explain especially like we come from europe so we do things slightly different so mm -hmm. we had a couple of doctors who were really good actually were trained in europe so that so they knew but going back to when we first came they're like oh your child hasn't had the chicken box a vaccination i said no they've had chicken pox well they need the vaccination or well, you can't get chicken pox again <laughs> from that and, and that's where stupidity kicks mm -hmm. in and so we have chicken pox parties back in the UK. If a one child has chicken pox in nursery, we bring all the kids in, so they all get it at once. Um, so we had to get a letter from the doctor in the UK to explain to the doctor here that you can't get chicken pox twice. You know what I mean? So that's when stupidity kicks and then in. And we had to get a yeah. test to prove that they've had the chicken yeah. pox. Yeah. So, but we you know, we understand. You know, we're we're guests in America, and you know, you know, we love being here as well. And so we're not like. We're like, not definitely not doing that. You know, we'll do it, but within reason. But when stupidity kicks in, then we'll question. I think question. that's really important because we are immigrants here. You know, we're not from this country and we've got to respect the rules of this country as well. You know, we had to go through the, the, the process and we've had to do everything that, um, you know, to be able to live in America, we've had to do a lot of things that maybe we might not necessarily agree with. But this is the choice we've made. If we were moving to Iran, we'd have to do the same thing. We'd have to make choices. But we want want to live here so we have to go through which has been a really really hard process you know we've been, we started moving during covid and we've done everything like completely 100 percent by the book which has cost firstly yeah. a hell of a lot of money and secondly like dean had his visa first and then i had to keep coming in and out of the country correctly i mean i've been detained i got i got arrested at the border for like seven hours because they just weren't sure what my visas were like. Well, the airport, not the border. The, the yeah, yeah. Border. <laughs> yeah, 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 the yeah, border. Border. yeah. Yeah, the airport mm. border. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a port of entry. Port yeah, of entry. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's that's that's pretty. I mean, it, it is what it is. Yeah, the the legal process of emigrating to the U.S. is fucking ridiculous. Um, and the, 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 we have a lot of British friends here, and it, it, it doesn't. It seems to be the same for them. But we we understand it. You know, yeah, long term. Sure. Yeah, you do it correctly. It is worth it. You know, it's changed our sure. lives. Being yeah, but it shouldn't be. I mean, it's it's all kind of predatory here, right? It's all built around having to go get an immigration attorney. They make it prohibitively uh, uh, complicated just yeah. so you'll have to go get an immigration attorney and pay this asshole another five to $15,000, not including the services that you have to get from the government, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. We fill, we actually fill out the form. They're just the ones who deliver it. That's yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's silly, man. It's it's like it reminds yeah. me of uh, Office Space when they're asking that dude what he does, and he goes, "Well, I take the reports from this person. I'm a people person. You know what I mean? It's like, all right, congratulations, dude. You're fucking our country up. But um, yeah, it's weird. Potatoes go go the illegal route. And like, well, we wouldn't <laughs> want to do that. Like that's horrendous, but. Um, the legal route is definitely really hard, um, mm -hmm. but 100 percent we're really pleased to be uh, here. And it's it, it, but it has been like an eye opening process. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, at some point during this process, you you um, started writing a children's book. Tell me about that. Um, I started with Live Your Own Way. So Live Your Own Way is really about a kid who's goes through life with people telling them that things are too too dangerous and that she shouldn't do that and it's you know it's like she's too much you know what for whatever reason she shouldn't be doing these things and she doesn't do them and then at the, the end of the book after she goes through all the things she decides actually I wanted to do it but so I can't be stopped by what other people are telling me is is safe or, or right or wrong and it's just about doing things your own way 
Um, and then the second book was about the, I guess, the five main um, immigration communities in the US. And we kind of go back to their country and just see all their different cultures and things. So the five friends, and then we all come back to America and celebrate America. And then the last one's just who to help today, which is probably my my favorite because a lot of people say to me, oh, you, you help a lot of people, but how do I get into helping people? And I'm like, well, open your eyes. There's mm. an opportunity everywhere, every day for you to help people. You just need to look for it, so. Yeah, yeah, I think everyone thinks helping people is is donating money and things like that, but just even just, you know, one of the things we talk about is the, um, you know, you talk about people not being able to communicate, the, the the dying art of people being able to speak to each other. You know, chivalry, I see it a lot, you know, with these kids mm. you know, opening a door for an adult, you know, just the, those basics, you know, that's helping someone. Yeah, um, men in general. Men, yeah, men in general as well, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a dying art. Um, yeah, we, we're always quite conscious of that and sort of really want to instill that in our kids mm -hmm. as well. You know, our biggest compliment for our kids is, is not is when people say to us afterwards, oh, your kids are so polite and they're not polite to us. Then that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. One of the principles of this show uh, of Citizen is I'll do something every day to help my country. My countrymen are all men. Right. I think it's like reframing your mind to be on the lookout for people that need help. I mean, if you again, uh, a lot, as you said, if you, you can't find somebody that needs help, you're fucking blind. I mean, it's, you know, and it doesn't have to be anything major. Sometimes it's just, you know, putting the shopping cart back in the fucking cart corral or picking up a piece of trash off the ground. You know, yeah. you're not gonna, I, I think people feel overwhelmed by all of the fucked up shit that happens in life sometimes. And they like, well, how can I Hell, I can't stop you. you and you're right you can't end homelessness or hunger but you can probably end that motherfucker's hunger right now just get some food and take it to him right it, it's yeah. and when enough people participate that way then things do get better quite a bit better actually yeah you're true yeah i was i was in santa monica the other day and there was a, a an older lady who she i think she fell over in her wheelchair homeless lady she fell over and the amount i was with the kids and the amount of people were literally stepping over her to get past her like literally just stepping over her it was you know obviously like people i don't know get scared or they don't want to offer to help or they know that you know she might have mental health problems and might attack but it was this this is a fellow human being who needs some help here like stop and help yeah i think it's also because the fear of litigation you know, you know, if you take, if you forget that, so that's one thing we, you know, it was quite good in the special forces, you know, is that, you know, not that you were above the law at all, but we knew that we knew the law and, and we knew mm. that so if there's any sort of, because we do have our own army legal system as well, but if you step in, a, you know, you're about to kick in a door, if you have any fear of any potential litigation, you, you're going to pause, you're not going to be your, your true self. And so that's the same here. You know, the amount of people I see with these videos on Instagram, you know, someone being assaulted and there's 40 people with mobile phones. I think they all should be accountable and, and charged as well. I think there should be an element of, of bringing it back that you, you should, who's that gentleman who intervened on the underground, the ex Marine guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, everyone's just fearful of, of that. And so, um, um, yeah, I think the litigation, so sort of culture doesn't help at all. Um, but we need to get the balance right. That's mm -hmm. the and that need, what you're saying is that need that fight, flight, freeze, or film seems to be the fourth one now. Mm -hmm. like that seems to be the reaction now. It's like put the phones away, get yeah. the phone away. Is it is it know? like that in the UK as well? Because it, it's definitely like that here. I mean, look, the the bystander effect has been around a lot longer than cell phones or social media for sure. Um, so the, 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 this psychological principle that the more people are present, the less likely somebody is to intervene. That's been around for a very long time, maybe all of human history, but it has been amplified to a great degree. Now, it isn't just people. It isn't just group fear or group anxiety keeping people from doing stuff. Now it's become voyeuristic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I think for me, is you know, as you touched on, it's the fight, flight, freeze. Not everyone is capable. You know, people's mm. reactions are slightly different. But when there's a group of people, there's someone in there who's a fighter um you know but i don't know if it is the repercussions or whatever there's a great video back in the uk i mean i don't know how old it is now these guys on mopeds are smashing the uh the jewelry shops to get 
you know, uh, smash and grabs. Mm. And it's like a woman just comes out of nowhere, you just see her like running in with a handbag and just start, you know, start battering them. You know, and, and all, all these grown men are just stood there and it's like, but that's a different culture, a different era. You know what yeah. I mean? So this may be, you know, they're not used to, but I think there's or they don't know what to do. That whole cancel culture as well. Like people are scared to say what they actually believe now. That's the, the other thing is like, there's nothing. And then I think that there's, to be able to stand up and say what you believe doesn't mean that you necessarily will believe that same thing in five years and that you should mm. then be punished for that. Um, you know, my opinion, I I love the fact that I've got an open mind and you can change my opinion if you give me the right argument to it. Like, it's not going to stay the same. So I think we can evolve and we can change. So we shouldn't be scared of saying what it is that we're thinking right now. But I think the way that it is in the world, it's like you're going to get your accounts shut down or you're going to get cancelled or nobody's going to speak lose to you your or you lose your job. Yeah. Or... <clears throat> yeah, it's people worried about the repercussions. You know, if you, if you don't agree with one, you know, talking about divisions, in, especially in the US, you're one or the other. And if you don't agree with that, then you're automatically a racist or a homophobic. Mm. That's not and so and i think understanding that we're susceptible to being manipulated you know i work a lot in human trafficking that's the main area of what it is that i do um and there's only certain times that it'll get put into the forefront and then when it should be put into the forefront if we took like the george floyd for example um you know there was such an uprising about this one person about what what we should be doing in, in cultures and it's like it, it was driving me crazy because yeah okay whatever your your thoughts are on that situation but there's 46 million slaves in the world right mm. now pulling that statue down or doing that thing isn't you know why don't we focus on this yeah. rather than this, this one person sure, yeah, yeah. in here yeah yeah well you can tell it's an industry right it isn't really a, it's not a social movement anymore it's a business this social yeah. justice stuff is a business now because you're right i mean I do a lot of uh, human trafficking stuff as well, and and mostly on the migrant side. That's what I've been tracking on. Um, uh, but we found recently there's eighty five thousand people, eighty five thousand uh, migrant children, who are just missing. Right? We we don't know where they are. So they come over the border, they get detained by CBP, they're pushed over to ORR, the Office of Resettlement, and then they're sent to one of these uh private groups like southwest key programs or some or mvm inc or one of these companies and they get sent to a sponsor right that's unverified it's just a human being that knew that this other human being existed that's kind of the threshold and sometimes seven or more to one location right like one physical address which doesn't even exist which is not a real home or anything like it's like a strip mall building and right as of as of a month ago there's eighty five thousand of these kids that they don't know where they are Right. Eighty five fucking thousand. And just in the last six months or so. Um, and I, I wonder, I want to get your perspective <clears throat> uh, before we get out of here about this, because I know you do work in that area. Um, this movie, The Sound of Freedom, it's it's a bit churched up Hollywood stuff, a little bit of it. Right. But this is a real fucking problem. And I wonder from your perspective, why do you think that the political class, the media in Hollywood are trying to fucking tear this down and pretend like it's some kind of conspiracy theory because it is very real and very demonstrably real. Hmm. With Sound of Freedom, I think, so from the number of communities that I work in, um, and I've got, I've got a set group of um, human trafficking organizations that I really work with and I really trust. The movement itself with anything, like whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whatever, Whenever something becomes a full focus, like the opioid crisis, there's so many organizations pop up and want to take advantage of the funding that's available, the kind hearts and things. I think with Sound of Freedom, there it's given a, a great focus to the trafficking um, problem. I think where, it's, especially a lot of the people that I work with, the issue comes is that it, it almost kind of gives us an idea that that's how trafficking happens, mm. that we, and that's not necessary. What it does is, for, for me, I worry about the focus now. I do like whenever something gives it focus, but when it's fully transparent as a true story, I think that's my my concern is because the true story is, is that your kids sitting on the internet right now talking to someone they don't know, those are the ones that you need to worry about. You know, grooming is, you know, 83% of kids getting into this are coming in through online now. And, and grooming is the way that it's happened. So when we see like, 
things about kids getting bundled into the back of cars or kidnapped or all this kind of the taken effect really mm. it's taken away from the fact that your kid is more likely to walk freely into that person's car and then you then got to try and like a trafficker loves a kid who's been manipulated who's been it's the whole kind of love bombing the, the grooming process because once you can get them to believe that they're doing mm -hmm. this because they want to and they go through the whole the grooming process um, that's the hardest part. It's easy to identify a kidnapped victim or somebody who's who's actually not in this because they want to be rescued because most of these girls are trying to rescue them when they're, they're so psychologically messed up or messed up on drugs that they don't even want to come out. So there's, the, there's I think, from the people that I know that have an issue with it, the issue is because it's pulling a highlight not to the way that it's actually happening. Mm -hmm. I could tell you about how the elites and, and some of the less... Uh, favorable people have got a problem with it. I don't know what their issue is around the religion part of it. Because honestly, trafficking is nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with politics. It is power and money. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody who, you know, you could be the richest of the rich. Like like kids kids that are um, from ultra high net worths are just as susceptible as the third world um, kid with nobody around them because it's they're looking for isolation. They're looking for vulnerability. They're looking for something that they can just get that hook in to be the person that will be able to convince them to do other things. So um, on the religion and politics side of it, I don't particularly have a, a, a comment, but that's... I think it's Hollywood. You know, as you know, it, it, we're Hollywood, the, the, the fine line between authenticity and entertainment. Sure, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It's made it look like really sexy, go mm -hmm. door kick. Where we, Alana, focuses more on the, the child exporting online protection. If you can manage this part at the beginning then you don't need to be door kicking in mums down in line sure, they yeah. know what, yeah, yeah. what they're looking for so yeah so there's mixed you know we we hear mixed mixed views about it and, and alana i don't know, you know just we we're in scotland last month alana just been awarded the mbe from king charles for her services to vulnerable women and, mm. and human trafficking as well so that's been uh uh that's sort of put you in the spotlight a bit more so yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. That's that same question. <laughs> and it's a hard one because it's difficult because you want highlight. You want people yeah. to understand mm -hmm. it and love it. And I love it when people are like, but when I hear about people paying like 500 grand to somebody to go and rescue a kid, I'm like, you know, and they're involved in the rescue. I'm like, we're like these task force spend months planning these mm -hmm. things. And there's a whole group of people and it's cross country and it's Interpol. And there's a lot of work goes into breaking down a trafficking organization. So if I hear that somebody's paid to rescue a kid, that sets alarm bells off for me and I get worried about that, especially if there's photo ops, you know, here's this right. rescue. Yeah. And, and then it's all like documented for social media and stuff. It's a little suspect, yeah. but I, I um... the greatest people that I know in the anti-trafficking field, you'll never know who they are. You'll never see them. They're yeah. they're, they're Yeah. Just it's funny. Them. People ask me a lot. What, who, which groups I work with. I'm like, they don't have name. There's no name to the group. It's a fucking bunch of former tier one guys that are fucking yeah, yeah. doing it. But you know, I, what, what are the, uh, criticisms I've heard of the film, aside from what you said, which is that that is an extreme example of something that can happen, but and, and which is that, but the most common one is like getting, uh, as you said, groomed on Facebook, specifically Facebook, right? Or Meta in general, Instagram as well, but particularly those two places. And then the way it made it seem like it's a foreign problem, right? Because the greatest consumer of these things is, are Americans, right? That that's unfortunately the the case. Uh, so you know, I, I I didn't care for that part of it either. It's basic yeah. economics, you know. It's a supply and demand. It really is basic economics, and there's just as much supply and demand happening in this country as what there is anywhere else. Um, and I don't think any borders or what like it is a global problem and it's happening you know we can get them from overseas we can get them on planes on ships across if there's a wall they'll get across like it doesn't matter it's 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 a it's a global issue and i think one of the biggest issues about human trafficking is we don't have international law around it so it's, it can vary from every place so being able to cross borders but crossing states you know simply crossing states is enough so they don't necessarily have to be bringing people in from it is happening right here and it is you know your kids sitting on the internet chatting to someone coming out so definitely a domestic issue yeah it is i mean and then you know it doesn't help that our closest neighbor uh mexico the the cartels are heavily involved in this stuff not just in Latin America, but here in America and in the United States. 
and uh, those governments are you know captured by the cartels they're they're they are as corrupt as any government's ever going to be so even if we did have international laws around this stuff get having a, an agency that it, like this is interpol's job right i don't know why they're not keen on on trying to move mountains in this we have well, you know global organizations like the wef trying to do all this weird shit right and and get countries to capitulate to them for some reason but nobody seems to care about this particular issue and i thought that of all the things that go on in, in global politics and american politics and social culture uh, more broadly speaking that protecting kids would be right at the top of everybody's list but it turns out yeah. it's not right it turns out that if you try hard to protect kids People call you fucking names, call you a conspiracy theory or theorists and all this other bullshit. It's like, no, this is happening, man. Somebody's got to do something about this. And as you yeah. said, there are 46 million people actively in slavery of some sort, primarily uh, uh, have been trafficked into it, right? And you know, there's, sorry. Sorry, I was going to say, and you're talking about south of the border, and you look north of the border, Canada. Canada is probably one of the worst places in the world for trafficking people because mm. it's so vast. And you can you can do it. And and that's why originally I did that bike ride. It was we were going to do it from southern Argentina to northern Alaska to, to highlight that. Mm -hmm. But we did it for mental health. But, yeah, it's not it's not just south of the border. It's north of the border as well. Yeah. You, uh, lost lost, lost your chain of thought. Eh? Oh, it happens. <laughs> well, look, we got to get out of here. But uh, tell me uh, one more time. Tell me where I can find you guys on the Internet and tell me where I can find any anything you've got going on right now. Uh, professionally or charitable charitable stuff going on that people need to know about give me the give me the rundown yeah yeah i mean everything's really simple it's alanastock.com deanstock.com and then all socials are pretty much those names as well we've we're, i couldn't even tell i think we wrote down the list of what we had going on the other day and there was 44 <laughs> individual things on it so i'm not going to go through that whole list but yeah. um yeah, our main our main fu fu function is still the security business. So that's still what we do as a as a full time uh, gig. The um, human trafficking stuff is obviously the the more philanthropy side, but there's no limit to any of the the philanthropic side now that we're advising on fundraising. So that's yeah. another thing. Dean's filming a TV show at the minute. One of the, the one of the well, one of the biggest networks anyway, which will be out next year. It's, can't really discuss too much of mm -hmm. it in the film in the final episode this month, but it's, it's in my wheelhouse. It's not garden, it's not bacon, <laughs> you know. It's it's military orientated, which will be good. I, I was actually chatting to the head of uh, one of the head of station for Yemen. He's like, I've just googled you. I said, don't Google me. <laughs> I said, there's, there's two Dean Stotts. There's the the author, the the the, the TV, and and the, the guest people. And as Alana touched on, it's it's still very much that private security stuff. You know, we help you know, get 1,200 out of Afghanistan. We've got people out of Sudan. We're still very much being in there. We just don't have a website. We're not, as as you said, mm. most people you work with who are actually on the ground getting stuff done don't really have have websites. But um, mm. but for us now staying in America, you know, this, is, this will be our home moving forward. For us to be able to continue in the work of philanthropy and and things like that you know security is sort of what brings in the bread and butter for us we have our documentary that we're working on at the minute which is about the, the bike ride what's going on now and then we've got something big coming up in the future that we've not spoke about as of yet but it's it's based around no plan b and it really is about ending this victimhood mentality and ending this like excuses and blame culture and working on that and then the final one sorry we've got we've got we've got a podcast our own podcast coming out called behind the scene but it's s w -E n so normally when people see me they're like well there's the special forces world record holder you know this guy but actually none of that would have been possible without alana mm. so i think in most relationships most organizations whether you're a celebrity sports personality uh entrepreneur someone in that re relationship is sacrificing for you to you know to, to push forward so we get two guests on we get the one that the world sees but also their partner as well and they talk about what they've been doing to enable that and as we as we're quite um as a good case study you can both be successful one mm. doesn't have to to hold or pause on their dreams to the other and we tend to find that normally when that happens there's resentment so we, sure. we talk about we talk about that the success of a team cool i'm looking forward to checking it out um everybody go check out uh Dean Stott, check out his book, Relentless. Check out the new podcast when it comes out. And uh, check out um, Dame Alana Stott as well. I guess people got to call you that now, right? 
<laughs> I'm trying to get Dean to curtsy. Uh, doing yeah, it. yeah. Well, I don't think dudes are supposed to curtsy necessarily, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, and then also check out her book, How to Ask for Money. It's it's good. It, there's a lot of really great information in there if you're gonna if you're gonna work if you if you work in charity uh, or or anything like that, or if you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, it's a great uh, book to read as well. Um, thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate your guys' time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yep. And then uh, thank you all for listening. This has been Citizen.